it is up with it podcast comrades thank you so much for being such honorable listeners to the carousel snapper victims i hope you are ready to come on a wonderful journey of discovery in this rickety communist submarine yeah what the fuck is up yo thanks for joining us again don't forget it's a new topic so if you want to win a shirt or whatever really fucking last week when i chose the two runners up for the thing one of them got a mug and the other one got a shirt and then the other main winner got a shirt but you know share our shit and one person per topic maybe even more will be chosen to win some shit so just do it help us out it really does help spread the word leave us a review all that good shit go fucking rate us on facebook or itunes or fucking wherever any little bit helps jump on the patreon yeah i think that's it so thanks to paul went for the fucking topic suggestion you're a mad dog and much love to everyone we shall see you on the flip side i told you i'd get an episode out on thursday night didn't i yeah i did yeah i did all right You've lost the plot, Sean. Ta-ta. Bye. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. You're listening to Carousel Sniper Victim, a dead glass design production, with your host, Sean Jeffrey. In the dark abyss of the central North Pacific lay the cold remains of the Soviet ballistic missile submarine K-129. I cannot think of any other achievement that ranks with what was accomplished. A secret journey into the ocean depths. We had been asked to raise and lower several million pounds in three miles of water. A challenge of ingenuity and imagination. I wondered, could we do this? Go down 16,500 feet, pick up such an immense object, bring it to the surface, Without the public, or the press, or the Russians knowing anything about it. Working at the cutting edge of technology, the CIA crafted a program of unparalleled imagination and engineering. A bunch of guys that were willing to think outside the box and put their neck way out and then go do it. This astonishingly bold plan was to secretly retrieve the Soviet submarine from an ocean depth of three miles. I don't think anything else will ever be built like it. A monumental feat of marine engineering. The heavy lift system was handling about 8,000 tons. It was massive, just massive. A mysterious CIA Cold War operation. What we hoped to get was code books, information on nuclear warheads, the two torpedoes, the three ballistic missiles. Codenamed Azorian, it would make history. The Russians couldn't say they didn't know what we were doing. They watched everything we did. A story of man's unprecedented resolve. Everybody at Global Marine was fully prepared to never tell that story. In May of 2019, the Smithsonian Museum published an article regarding the recently reopened International Spy Museum. On display in this museum, in an exhibit in a little corner, is a submarine control panel, a wig, detailed white prints, and a chunk of manganese. Together, these items represent relics of a Cold War espionage mission, so brazen that the museum's curator, Vince Horton, compares it to something out of a Hollywood movie. This mission, codenamed Project Azorian, involved the CIA commissioning the construction of a 600-foot ship to retrieve a sunken Soviet submarine from the ocean floor, all in complete secrecy. 
quote. I can't imagine there's another country in the world that would have thought, hmm, we found a Soviet submarine under more than three miles of water. Let's go steal it. End quote. Another way to think of it is this. Imagine standing atop the Empire State Building with a eight foot wide grappling hook suspended on a one inch diameter steel rope. Your task is to lower the hook to the streets below, snag a compact car filled with gold, and lift the car safely back to the top of the building. On top of that, the job has to be done without anyone noticing. That describes what the CIA did in Project Azorian. A highly secret six-year effort to retrieve a sunken Soviet submarine from the bottom of the Pacific Ocean during the height of the Cold War. Now you might not think so, but submarines have been around for quite a while, since the late 1800s to be precise. The H.L. Hunley was a Confederate submarine that operated during the American Civil War, and was the first submarine to sink an enemy ship, the Union vessel Housatonic, in 1864. Now for as long as they've had submarines, the world's navies have worried about losing them, and especially about how to find them when they are lost, ideally soon enough that the crew can still be rescued. Much of the technology and strategy deployed in sub search and rescue today can be traced back to 1963, when the USS Thresher was lost at sea off the coast of Massachusetts. The loss of that state-of-the-art submarine and her crew of 129 sent a shockwave that rippled through the US Navy's submarine program, leading to the creation of numerous deep sea programs that continue to this day. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, was in a constant state of catch-up with the United States. They were being forced to put older and more rundown submarines to sea in an effort to keep up with the global arms race taking place during the Cold War. Submarines such as K-129. Now by no means outdated, K-129 was still a state-of-the-art weapons platform but her crew were tired, and they were being forced to work longer and more frequent missions without being given adequate time to refresh and carry out necessary repairs on their aging vessel. None of the sub's officers had expected to be at sea in February of 1968. The boat had completed a normal two-month combat patrol in the Northeast Pacific on November 30th, 1967 and upon return the crew was split into two for the duration in port, as was the custom. Half of the personnel went on vacation while the other half were assigned to routine maintenance like cleaning, painting, repairs, and then halfway through the break they would swap roles. Subs of this type typically did two combat patrols each year, but when two different sister ships experienced mechanical problems early in February, and were deemed unfit for combat patrol, the Soviet Navy decided to send K-129 back to sea as to not disrupt the fleet's schedule. The nuclear ballistic missile submarine K-129 left Petropavlovsk on Russia's remote frozen Kamchatka Peninsula shortly after dark on February 24th, 1968. A routine but unexpected patrol. No external markings signified the sub's name, and even its hull number was painted over so that it would be unrecognisable to any ship that happened to notice it when it surfaced to gulp air and run the diesel motors that recharged its onboard batteries. Like all subs operating during the height of the Cold War, K-129 went to sea in full battle gear. She was 328 feet long from nose to tail, 
propelled by three 2,000 horsepower diesel engines when at the surface or in recharge mode, and three electric propulsion motors when cruising underwater and when silence was essential. The sub carried three R-21 ballistic nuclear missiles, also known as SSN-5 Serbs. Each R-21 had a white nose cone stuffed with a nuclear warhead and was loaded into one of the three vertical launch tubes that stood behind the sub's coning tower, the big middle bit that you see sticking up out of the long tube of the sub. A single R-21 warhead carried one megaton of punch. That's more than 65 times the explosive power of the bomb that levelled Nagasaki. And these subs had a range of over 755 miles, over 1,200 kilometres. The R-21 was also a historic weapon, the first Soviet missile that could be fired from a submerged submarine, giving the K-129 the ability to launch a preemptive nuclear strike from an undetectable position far from the American coastline, if war was to break out. Missile subs are relatively slow and vulnerable to attack. So to defend herself, K-129 carried two nuclear-tipped torpedoes loaded into the forward launch tubes. Each one of these nuclear-tipped torpedoes was capable of sinking an entire aircraft carrier. as well as a second set of conventional self-guided torpedoes in the stern bays to defend against attacks from just other attack submarines. Boats like K-129 were particularly critical to the Soviet Navy's mission. The Pacific Fleet was still young, and these diesel-powered ballistic missile subs of the 29th Division provided the most direct threat to America's major West Coast cities, a threat that the Americans couldn't easily track. The sub's role was to patrol the Pacific quietly and stand ready to act in the event of a nuclear war. A Soviet submarine's precise directives were never known to its crew upon departure, but the captain and crew of K-129 knew the broader plan. They were to follow a prescribed course to K-129 station, a relatively small block of ocean well to the northwest of Hawaii, and more or less sit there, in a remote section of the Pacific known for little more than gnarly weather and for being largely free of much nautical activity, except for the silent passage of American hunter-killer subs that stalked the Soviet missile subs. K-129's mission was fairly simple. Stay out of sight of these American hunter-killer subs or any other hostile American vessels until returning to base on May 5th at no later than 1200 hours. So on February 24th, the submarine slipped out of her bay, docked briefly alongside a floating barracks ship and then cruised onto the fleet weapons depot to pick up the ballistic missiles and nuclear-tipped torpedoes. Once loaded, the K-129 moved farther into the bay and anchored. She was waiting for the arrival of a large anti-submarine ship that escorted her as far as the booms that guarded the entrance to the bay. This was a standard procedure meant to signal loud and clear to any Americans watching out in the open ocean. This sub leaving port is on a combat mission and carrying live nukes. Back the fuck up. At 12.15 a.m. on February 25th, the submarine passed the booms and headed into the open ocean. At 1 a.m., a monitoring station picked up a signal that the K-129 had submerged. And then, it went quiet. After leaving Russian waters, the sub headed south until it reached 40 degrees latitude, then turned towards Japan. 
under orders to spend at least 90% of her time submerged, mostly at a depth of around 100 feet. The K-129 cruised more or less in a straight line, with a periodical zigzag to seek out and shake any American subs that might be trailing. Submarine warfare during the Cold War was a real game of hide and seek, cat and mouse. All captains of slower ballistic subs considered their vessels prey for attack subs and were trained to move evasively, making unpredictable course changes regularly. A sub might ascend or descend suddenly and would occasionally shut down all engines so that the crew could just sit silently and listen. Listen for any external sound that would indicate American hunter killers lurking nearby. At 180 degrees longitude, the K-129 was to turn again, this time towards the coast of the United States. To prevent detection, especially considering the rising tensions in the region, K-129 travelled for two weeks in silent mode, running entirely on battery power. As far as anyone back at command was concerned, she was proceeding as directed. The Pacific Fleet Command expected to hear from all deployed subs at pre-arranged times, but the K-129 was to travel in silent mode for those first two weeks at sea, so until the 8th of March, there was no reason for anyone back in Kamchatka to be worried at all. On the 8th of March though, a watch officer at Soviet Navy Central Command noticed that the sub had failed to transmit a radio message as scheduled. The watch officer brought this matter to his superior's attention, and an alert was declared. A failure to communicate didn't necessarily indicate disaster. Radio transmitters are not perfect, and Soviet submarines were notorious for equipment failure. Weather can also be an issue, and if a sub's commander felt that his boat was under threat of discovery or attack by American vessels, he might also choose to remain silent. Thus, Soviet admirals didn't automatically assume the worst when a sub failed to communicate, but it was rare for one to go completely dark for more than a full day. And when the K-129 missed a scheduled communication for the second consecutive day, then Fleet Command really began to panic. There were plans for rescuing vessels in distress, and the Soviet Navy put them into effect on the 9th of March, dispatching an armada of ships from various ports out to sea. A damaged submarine will always surface, if possible, so the fleet's reflex is to commence a rapid search for a crippled sub somewhere inside a predetermined area. In this case, one measuring about 854,000 square miles. Searchers were to look for a submarine bobbing on the surface, probably without power or communication, provided the sub's structural integrity hadn't been compromised, it would be safe there floating on the surface. Every sub in the fleet carried enough provisions on board to keep a crew alive for three months at least. And so, the search intensified. Two destroyers, three frigates, three minesweepers, two motherships, ten support vessels, in addition to four other submarines, participated in a methodical search led by planes that circled overhead. In total, 36 flagged vessels participated in the hunt for K-129, working day and night, using echo and sonar sounders and dragging photographic equipment that scanned the depths far below the surface. All the while, surveillance planes flew overhead. At least 53 planes took part tracking the sub's intended path, looking for any wreckage on the surface that would help narrow down the search area. Over the next 73 days, Soviet planes would make a total of 286 flights over the area. Weather 
just made the matters worse. Winters can be brutal in the North Pacific, and the Soviet fleet ran smack bang into the front of just violent storms, with heavy snow, gale force winds, and waves cresting as high as 45 feet, or over 14 meters. During the early days of the search, the ocean was as fierce as it could be, with conditions registering at or near a nine on the Douglas Sea Scale, a scale designed to express the sea's roughness for navigation, and the scale only goes as high as nine. At that level, waves can reach over 50 feet, and the sea is described, and this is in technical terms, as quote, phenomenal. The biggest problem was that the Soviets didn't actually know where to look. They only knew where K-129 had been last, on the 7th of March, and where it was headed, to the Hawaii station. So they focused the search along that line, looking for oil slicks, debris, or anything else on the surface that could indicate a possible disaster. The initial search zone was vast more than 800,000 square miles as I've said, and it got bigger as the search failed to locate any signs of the sun, growing to over 1 million square miles, which is just an almost impossibly large search area, especially considering another factor, the ocean's depth. In that area of the Pacific, the bottom is nearly four miles or over six kilometers deep. And because all signs at the time pointed to a catastrophic loss, K-129 wasn't likely to be found on the surface. In all likelihood, she lay shattered on the bottom of the ocean. It was obvious to the United States Navy, and anyone else who had been told about the Soviets' vast and fruitless search of the North Pacific that they'd lost a submarine. A submarine that the Navy suspected with some degree of confidence to be K-129. This is the Cold War, remember, everyone knows everything about each other. Now this presented a tantalizing thought. If the US Navy could locate the sub's precise location, it might be able to access the wreck and mine it for a host of valuable intelligence, including communication codes, code-breaking machinery, and most compelling of all, the nuclear warheads atop the ballistic missiles. Any combination of these things would provide the single most important intelligence hall of the entire Cold War to date. Both the United States and the Soviet Union knew basically what the other side was packing. But when it came to the specifics of those atomic missiles and the warheads, the two adversaries were guessing. Getting their hands on an actual Soviet missile, intact, would allow the US nuclear analysts to unlock any number of secrets about the enemy's arsenal, in particular, the makeup of the warheads and the design of the guidance system, which could enable the United States to build better anti-missile defenses, specially calibrated to the Soviet design. After months of trying and failing, the Soviets abandoned their extensive search efforts and listed K-129 as lost at sea and in stepped the US Navy and intelligence services. The US Navy located the submarine about 1,500 miles northwest of Hawaii, on the ocean floor 16,500 feet below. Now recognizing the immense value of the intelligence on Soviet strategic capabilities that would be gained if the submarine was recovered, the CIA, agreed to lead such a recovery effort with support from the Department of Defense. CIA engineers faced a daunting task, to say the least. Lift the huge, 
1,750 tonne, 132 foot long wrecked submarine intact from an unknown ocean abyss more than three miles below, under total secrecy. That five degrees rudder? That five degrees rudder, I suppose. In 1970, after careful study and research and development, a team of CIA engineers and contractors determined that the only technically feasible approach would be to use a large mechanical claw, like a giant skill tester, to grab the hull and then use heavy duty winches mounted on a surface ship to lift it to the surface. Now legally speaking, the US was concerned that the project could leave them open to charges of piracy if the Soviets had any inkling of the illicit submarine salvaging plans. Wanting to sidestep diplomatic tensions and keep whatever knowledge was to be gleaned from the mission secret, the CIA constructed an elaborate cover story with the help of the eccentric and enigmatic billionaire, Howard Hughes. Now most people from around my age will probably know Howard Hughes as the character that Mr. Burns sort of turns into when he goes eccentric and builds the Spruce Moose. Smithies, I've designed a new plane. I call it the Spruce Moose and it will carry 200 passengers from New York's Idlewild Airport to the Belgian Congo in 17 minutes. That's quite a nice model, sir. Model? I don't want that unpredictable lunatic working in my casino. Fine, we'll transfer him to the nuclear plant, sir. Oh, my beloved plant. How I miss her. Bah! To hell with this! Get my razor, draw a bath, and get these Kleenex boxes off my feet. Certainly, sir. And, uh, the jars of urine? Oh, we'll hang on to those. Now, to the plant! We'll take the spruce moose! Hop in! But, sir... I said, hop in. Leonardo DiCaprio in The Aviator. The soda, you know what I mean. Milk, please, in the bottle, with the cap still on. Okay, Howard, what? Yeah, run real 10 again. I think we're duplicating a shot here. And tell Jimmy I want 10 chocolate chip cookies. All right, medium chips, none too close to the outside. Got it? All of that is Howard Hughes inspired. The aviation mogul lent his persona to the construction of this 618 foot long ship to be named the Hughes Glomar Explorer, which was advertised as a deep sea mining research vessel. Two years later in 1972, a champagne christening ceremony and fabricated press release celebrated the birthing of the ship. The ship included a derrick similar to an oil drilling rig, a pipe transfer crane, two tall docking legs, a huge claw-like capture vehicle, a centered docking well which they called the moon pool, large enough to contain the hoisted sub, and doors to open and close the well's floor. To preserve the mission's secrecy, the capture vehicle was built under roof and loaded from underneath the ship from a submerged barge. With these special capabilities, the ship could conduct the entire recovery underwater, away from the view of other ships, aircraft or spy satellites. The heavy lift operation was complex and just riddled with risk. While moving with the ocean currents, the ship had to lower the capture vehicle by adding 60 foot sections of supporting steel pipe, one at a time. When it reached the submarine, the capture vehicle then had to be positioned to straddle the sunken submarine and its powerful jaws had to grab the hull. Then the ship had to raise the capture vehicle with the submarine in its clutches by reversing the lift process and removing the supporting pipe sections one at a time until the submarine was securely stowed in the ship's docking well. So many possibilities for things to go wrong. That summer, the Glomar Explorer 
with the approval of President Richard Nixon, set off towards the spot where K-129 was now resting. Two separate Soviet ships, which more than likely were loaded with intelligence operatives, closely monitored the supposed mining vessel as it worked to retrieve the submarine. But somehow, the mission went undetected. As the 274 pieces of heavy steel pipe that stretched between the claw and the ship were being slowly hauled back on board, with the submarine in the giant claw's grasp, the second Soviet boat sailed away. None the wiser. After about a week of slow upward progress, Project Azorian finally completed the lift of K-129 but only part of it. About midway through the process, a few of the grabber arms encircling the submarine sheared off, and a large part of K-129 fell back to the ocean floor. While the later media reports and history books generally relayed that the more desirable components of the submarine, like the code room and other important stuff sank. Others remained sceptical of the details surrounding the project's apparent failure. As do I. The curator of the International Spy Museum said, quote, The conventional wisdom has become that this was a failed mission. The CIA has allowed that belief to be what everyone understands. But why would they not? I always say, we have no idea what they got. Many of the details in this story are sourced from CIA declassified documents and recently published historical accounts, but since other findings from the mission are still classified, and the CIA may have had reason to obscure the story, I say scepticism remains warranted." End quote. We do know, however, that the Glomar Explorer retrieved the bodies of several of K-129's crew members, whom they gave a military burial at sea, which the CIA filmed and gave to Russia almost 20 years later. Coincidentally, the retrieval also brought up manganese samples from the bottom of the sea, the material that the Glomar Explorer was reportedly researching. Attempts to raise the lost portion had to be cancelled as news broke of the covert operation, some newspapers claiming that it was a waste of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money. In the end, apparently the CIA did not get the code books they so desperately desired, but instead recovered two nuclear torpedoes and the bodies of six Soviet crewmen. But rumours that there was more to the story refused to go away. One theory set out in American scientist John Craven's 2001 book, The Silent War, was that the submarine had been trying to launch a preemptive nuclear strike before the missile exploded and sent it to the bottom of the ocean. Craven, who is an expert on naval technology, discovered that one of the nuclear torpedoes was missing. On that, he built a theory involving a rogue crew trying to start some sort of World War III, which I think might be taking a bit of creative liberty. As of this year, 2019, the files, photographs, videotapes and other documentary evidence remain closed to the public. A few pictures appeared in a 2010 documentary showing the K-129 wreck, the bow and the sail with the missile compartment heavily damaged showing only one missile tube left attached to the structure. So, one big looming question remains. What caused K-129 to go down in the first place? The official Soviet Navy hypothesis is that K-129, while operating in snorkel mode, slipped below its operating depth. Now such an event combined with a mechanical failure or improper crew reaction can cause flooding sufficient to sink the boat, but 
This account has not been accepted by many. And four main alternative theories have been advanced to explain the loss of K129. These range from battery malfunctions to a collision with the USS Swordfish, or even a patrol deviation, perhaps the submarine was going rogue. In August of 1993 though, Ambassador Malcolm Toon presented to a Russian delegation K-129's ship's bell. Now according to the book Red Star Rogue, this bell had been permanently attached to the middle of the Koning Tower in K-129, thus indicating that in addition to the bow of the submarine, the critical and valuable midsection of the submarine was at least partially recovered by Project Azorian. The premise of the book Red Star Rogue is that a failsafe device designed to be activated in the event of an unauthorised fire command of its nuclear missiles caused two catastrophic explosions. And strangely enough, two acoustic signatures matching explosions were picked up by the Navy's sound surveillance system. A retired United States Navy captain, Peter Hutchhausen, and former naval attaché in Moscow, said he had a brief conversation in 1987 with Admiral Peter Navoschev, who told him, quote, Captain, you were very young and inexperienced, but you will learn that there were some matters that both nations have agreed to not discuss, and that one of these is the reason we lost K-129. End quote. In October of 1992, Robert Gates, as the Director of Central Intelligence, visited Moscow to meet with then President Boris Yeltsin of Russia. He said, As a gesture of good intent, a symbol of a new era, I carried with me the Soviet naval flag that had shrouded the coffins of the half dozen Soviet sailors whose remains the Glomar Explorer had recovered when it raised part of the Soviet ballistic missile submarine from deep in the Pacific Ocean in the mid-1970s. I also was taking to Yeltsin a videotape of their burial at sea, complete with prayers for the dead and the Soviet national anthem. A dignified and respectful service, even at the height of the Cold War. Oh, I bid farewell to the port and the land And I paddle away from brave England's white sands To search for my long ago forgotten friends To search for the place I hear all sailors end As the souls of the dead fill the space of my mind I'll search without sleeping till peace I can find I fear not the weather, I fear not the sea I remember the fallen, do they think of me When their bones in the ocean forever will be Plot a course to the night, to a place I once knew To a place where my hope died along with my crew so I swallow my grief and face life's final test To find promise of peace and the solace of rest As the souls of the dead fill the space of my ears Their laughter like children, their beckoning cheers My heart longs to join them, sing songs of the sea I remember the fallen, do they think of me? When their bones in the ocean forever will be When at last before my ghostly shipmates I stand I shed a small tear for my home upon land Though their eyes speak of deaths filled with struggle and strife Their smiles below say I don't owe them my life as the souls of the dead fill the space of my eyes And my boat listed over and tried to capsize I'm this far from drowning, this far from the sea I remember the living, do they think of me When my bones in the ocean forever will be Now that I'm staring down at the darkest abyss 
I'm not sure what I want, but I don't think it's this. As my comrades call to stand fast and forge on. I make sail for the dawn till the darkness has gone. As the souls of the dead live forever in my mind, as I live all the years that they left me behind, I'll stay on the shore but still gaze at the sea. I remember the fallen and they think of me, for our souls in the ocean together will be. I remember the fallen and they think of me, for our souls in the ocean together will be.